Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining BGI and MGI's COVID-19 webinar series. This is the fourth webinar since we started the series from October, and I wanted to thank our audience for your continued interest and support. Today's webinar has a title, Hit the Ground Running, the clinical venture of a startup COVID-19 testing lab led by Blackhawk Genomics. Um, my name is Charles Bao. I'm the general manager of BGI Americas Corporation. We are very honored to have invited Dr. Tudi Tatum, CEO and founder of Black Hawk Genomics, as well as Dr. John Hansen, lab director from Absolute Genomics. Black Hawk is BGS partner in the US who is specialized in delivering clinical laboratory solutions. And Absolute Genomics is a recent example of how we work together to deliver a COVID-19 testing laboratory with BGS workflows. Today's webinar will include the following topics. Um, I will provide a quick update of BGS COVID-19 business. Tudi and John will share their professional insights of laboratory safety considerations, reporting guidelines, and how they validated BGS assay for COVID-19 testing at Absolute Genomics. We will cover our presentation in about 40, 45 minutes uh, with around 10 to 15 minutes for Q&A in the end. Uh, if you have any question, please feel free to submit uh, in the Q&A box anytime during the webinar. The speakers will address um, uh, the question during the Q&A session in the end. Please do not submit your question using the chat box. Um, here is a snapshot of BGS global responses since the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, so far, uh, BGS RT-PCR kit for SARS-CoV-2 testing has received global emergency authorization, including the US, Canada, EU, China, Japan, Australia, Singapore, and recently Brazil and Mexico as well. Our product is also on WHO's emergency user listing. Our emergency use authorization by the US FDA and Health Canada covers a high throughput workflow that includes automated extraction and RT-PCR testing. BGI is the first in the world to identify a SARS-CoV-2 nucleic acid sequence and the first to receive regulatory approval in China on January the 26th of this year. As of today, we have distributed more than 35 million tests already um, to 188 countries. BGI maintains a daily manufacturing capacity of over 2 million reactions per day for our RT-PCR kit. And since the pandemic, um, by working with charity organizations, we have collectively donated 340,000 kits to places where the testing is in urgent demand. Initially from the city of Wuhan in China, where the virus was first detected, um, BJ introduced a total laboratory solution uh, called FireEye or the Huayan Lab. The total lab solution that included all the lab equipment, testing reagents, consumables, laboratory design and, and construction, reporting were fully deployed by BGI. And we were very quickly um, delivered massive testing capacity for local governments, communities, and organizations. The laboratory solution also evolved into a few versions that includes new or renovated laboratory, mobile air lab, and mobile container labs. So far, we have delivered over 70 such labs in over 17 countries, with a total testing capacity of 436,000 tests per day. And due to regulatory restrictions, the Huayan Lab solution is not available in the US market. And this is the reason why we chose to work with Black Hawk Genomics, who is the expert in clinical laboratory development in the US. And by combining expertise from both Black Hawk and BGI, we are aiming to help laboratories to establish new COVID-19 testing workflow with high efficiency and under full compliance. Now with the pandemic going into almost a full year, uh, we are witnessing evolving demand for testing, including work sites to screen essential employees, college campuses, airports, cruise lines, as well as entertainment and sport events. We're also seeing that beyond the traditional molecular microbiology or virology lab, there are new startups or spin-off companies that are developing and offering COVID-19 testing. There are non-infectious disease clinical laboratories 
who are building new COVID-19 testing menus, and the mobile laboratories um, to meet various emerging demands. However, many of these laboratories face various bottlenecks that include the following. For example, uh, meeting regulatory and uh, quality requirements to perform clinical testing, experience in building efficient lab solution, trained personnel for molecular virology testing, and post-COVID burdens for the lab investments. And, and I'm glad um, Tori and John um, will share their valuable insights in today's webinar to help laboratories to address these concerns. As a high-level summary, um, BGI and, and MGI's COVID-19 RT-PCR testing workflow includes automated sample transfer, an EUA automated extraction and RT-PCR testing equipment plus reagents with compatibility with a number of uh, PCR instruments. The detailed product info is available on BGI's website. And here are some of our recent highlights and new developments. Uh, recently, we have introduced a clinical laboratory partnership program to accelerate testing expansion. The program was discussed in our previous webinar sessions. We are working on new product solutions that include a saliva amendment to our current, current assay and a new multiplex panel that detects SARS-CoV-2 and flu A and B. We hope these products can be available in the North, North American markets very soon. We recently passed FDA's reference panel study, and FDA acknowledged that uh, the sensitivity and specificity of our kit is consistent with what was claimed in our EUA. We are also looking to further expand our COVID-19 testing menu through licensing and partnerships, and are open to such conversations with any interested parties. In the end, I'm glad to introduce our honored speakers. Dr. Tudi Tatum is a CEO and founder of Blackhawk Genomics. She is a clinical genomic scientist with deep experience in molecular biology, molecular laboratory workflow, and technical development. She currently serves on the American Board of Bioanalysis and is an NGS and Molecular Pathology Specialty Inspector for the College of American Pathologists. She is also a clear laboratory director for the UPMC Genome Center and the Discovery Life Science Clinical Genomics Laboratory. Dr. Tatum has held faculty positions with the Texas Tech University. She got her PhD from University of New Mexico School of Medicine and her MBA from UC Berkeley has School of Business. Dr. John Hansen is a board certified lab director working primarily in the molecular microbiology and genetics lab space. He received his PhD from Texas Tech University and worked for seven years at RTL Genomics, where he was managing director until January 2017. His experience centered around next generation sequencing applications and laboratory compliance. He currently split, splits his time between Black Hawk Genomics, where he is vice president, and being the clear lab director for Absolute Genomics, Capstone Healthcare, and Provis.dx and a consulting director for EGL Eurofins. Without further ado, I would like to switch over to Tudi and John. I want to thank them both for taking their precious time to prepare for this talk out of their busy schedule, and I hope the insights and experience will be valuable to our audience. Thank you. So Charles, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, we very much appreciate the invitation to speak with everyone today. Uh, John and I have um, been together working with Blackhawk Genomics for nearly six years, and we're very excited to be able to talk today about a project with one of our clients who very rapidly wanted to stand up uh, qPCR sequencing at high scale. So before we start into that, I'll just give you a brief background of our firm and who we are. So we are a molecular diagnostics consulting firm and we help people to make sure that they're up to date with the technology choices that are out there because we are in a really rapidly evolving market and the options of types of testing and the complexity of testing is ever increasing with time. So it's really important that, that our customers make good choices to make sure that they remain both clinically relevant and commercially successful. Okay, go to the next slide. 
we work with all sizes of customers from very small independent reference laboratories and very small can be defined as one person that might just be a laboratory director who serves all functions within the lab from accessioner to testing personnel to oversight of the laboratory up through very large genome centers and national scale projects that have a wide range of testing and a great complexity of testing platforms within their facility. Okay, let's go to the next one. So if you wanna think about what our core offerings are and what we really do, we can work with laboratories from the very conception of the laboratory itself before a space has even been identified in which to place the laboratory through the entire life cycle of a project and the ability of the laboratory to issue that very first patient report to that clinician, including all of the parts of selection and design and planning of the laboratory, staffing it, training everyone, the validation of the assays that they want to run, making sure that there is clinical relevance to the assays that they want to run, and ensuring that the laboratory is operating in a compliant manner and getting through the accreditation process. The other area uh, that we uh, see customers see, seek us out is whenever they're looking for expansion of services in an existing laboratory. And this might be a laboratory that's focused on one area of clinical practice, or it might be a hospital that has never potentially gone into molecular diagnostics and wants to bring this into their regional center or any other type of a facility that might be more in the traditional side of clinical lab science. And then finally, another portion of the services that we offer are what we characterize as professional services. So many laboratories don't have resources in the form of medical geneticists or other professionals that are experienced in molecular diagnostic case analysis and reporting. And if the only thing that is keeping them from offering this as a line of service within their facility are those types of resources on the backside that are, are more professional in nature in terms of boarded individuals or molecular pathologists, then we can work with them to provide that in a distributed manner. Okay, so to give you an idea of what our comprehensive validation services look like, it really is soup to nuts or beginning to end. It starts with the initial assay design and approach, which includes all of these factors like design of the lab space and identification of how, uh, what types of equipment, and where we're gonna place the equipment within the laboratory, making sure it's installed properly and starting down the process of filling out the licensure and accreditation paperwork, going through the validation project management and making sure that we've identified a proper set of validation samples we have appropriate clinically derived materials, making sure that we provide assistance as is required to the laboratory for the on-site validation, wet lab work itself, as well as the bioinformatics, staff training, making sure that we have a good quality management system in place for the laboratory, uh, reviewing the SOPs for all of the analytic processes that are in place. In the case of very large laboratories or very high throughput laboratories, ensuring that we've selected appropriate automation and ensuring that that has also been validated and functional in the laboratory. And uh, along those lines, also making sure that we've got LIMS integration for all of our processes, including the back end with billing and the front end with this accessioning and integrating with any other secondary or tertiary analysis tools that are required. And then finally, as we go through the life cycle of this project, it's uh, often the case where owners of a laboratory or other staff need us to interface with their marketing personnel to help them to develop materials that are accurate and also comprehensible by their physician customers and by patients, as well as some of the details that are somewhat technical in nature for going through the process to make sure they're reimbursed, including the Z code submission through the McKesson system and uh, interfacing with the billing and coding specialists to make sure that things are coded properly. And the final piece of that, of course, is making sure that the laboratory passes its inspection and is operating in a compliant manner. So we offer pre and post inspection services uh, to, to that effect, depending upon the level of service that a laboratory might need or the type of consultation that they're comfortable with. So to give you an idea of the types of projects that we can take on. They can be large academic medical centers. They can be even larger country scale projects 
or it might be something along the lines of a regional reference laboratory or a hospital laboratory. All of those are certainly within our scope of expertise. And in the first case, we had been uh, requested to help a large academic medical center on the East Coast to develop a brand new genome center that would be best in class. So there were a lot of requirements uh, that went into that uh, with a very high throughput sequencing platforms. But the result of that after about a year was the opening of a, a fully functional academic genome center that was able to offer whole genome sequencing, whole exome sequencing, RNA-seq, and is now also doing some molecular infectious disease testing that is cap accredited. In the case of the country scale project, this was not necessarily taken on strictly as a clinical project, but as a population level, uh, large scale sequencing project with the goal being to be able to sequence 1 million citizens of this country. So that was able to be carried out in about eight months. And then finally, the more typical project for us is a commercial reference laboratory. And in this case, this was a laboratory that did not have an existing area of service in molecular diagnostics, but was interested in molecular microbiology and genetics and potentially going into identity testing as well. So we scoped a, a somewhat stepwise project for this group and were able to add 23 new analytes to the uh, test menu and the scope of service for the laboratory in approximately 10 weeks and generate a robust ongoing revenue source. And we're very proud to say that particular laboratory has continued to expand and has been profitable in this area of practice for about uh, the last four years. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. Just to give you an idea of the level of automation support and the types of projects that we support, this is actually a photograph of the laboratory space at the end of the project for the large academic center. Uh, and it kind of goes through some of the, the key components. I think what is most important for this particular project is that we were able to place five ultra high throughput sequencers and a couple of uh, the smaller platforms for this laboratory so that they can generate many hundreds of human genomes in a very short period of time for rare disease and uh, for uh, neonatal sequencing. The automated workflows in this laboratory are all taken care of on a couple of liquid handlers, and um, they also have capacity for biobanking as well. So the laboratory is able to be operated with a, somewhat of a skeleton crew of five medical technologists, but able to generate enormous amounts of sequence data. So let's go to the next slide. That all being the case, going back to the slide here with our core offerings, what we'd like to talk to you here today about is not a sequencing based project, but in fact, a uh, molecular infectious disease qPCR project. And as we all know, in the past year, COVID-19 has presented some really unique challenges to laboratories commercially and also operationally. So early on, in this process, laboratories were able to source materials, and if they've been offering COVID-19 testing, it was not that uh, big of a uh, challenge for them to be able to bring that online. But very quickly into this process, we were finding that laboratories were uh, having difficulties with sourcing of materials, identification of equipment, being able to find individuals who were able to actually perform testing and had those previous skills. And a large number of laboratories reached out to us to uh, want us to uh, work with them on what was essentially a lab creation project in terms of being able to offer an, a new area of service for them. So it wasn't necessarily even just service expansion. It was training the personnel, helping them through the regulatory process, and especially in light of the EUA requirements that were put in place by FDA, this was usually somewhat involved. And we were very fortunate in the United States to have BGI come in and offer a robust system with a non-constrained supply chain at uh, a point about halfway through the, the pandemic this past year. And um, we're uh, very happy to be able to talk to you today about a success story with one of our laboratory customers on the East Coast. And with that, I'm gonna hand this off to Dr. John Hansen, who is the CLIA Laboratory Director of the laboratory in Pennsylvania. I want to start off by thanking BGI, follow up with Tutti for giving us the invitation to come and speak today. We are uh, 
really involved in bringing COVID testing online to help patients and municipalities find better ways of tracking the disease. And so I'd like to share with you a little bit of work that we've done at Absolute Genomics, where I am the CLIA lab director, as Tudi mentioned. Absolute is a small lab. Our mission is leveraging molecular methodology, methodology for pathogen and infectious disease detection. Uh, we're right now focusing primarily on molecular pathology, molecular microbiological pathology, and we are offering end-to-end -end COVID-19 testing. The lab is located in Mayfield, Pennsylvania, which is a small town right outside of Scranton. It's a, a, a part of the state that has been hit really hard by economic problems. And so being able to start up a lab here is important for the community around us. Next slide. So we're located again, as I said, in the Northeastern Pennsylvania. The lab started offering testing for COVID in October of 2020. And we have a relatively small staff with five testing personnel, which includes two supervisors and uh, three accessioners. We have a very well apportioned lab space. The lab has dedicated facilities for accessioning and you can see there's a lot of space here for uh, sorting samples and actually scanning in uh, important information. Next slide. And we also have uh, dedicated unidirectional spaces. So we have a clean reagent room for PCR setup, and then the samples would move into an extraction room. And you can see the BGI, or MGI instrumentation here on the, the counter in front of us. Next slide. And a room for our imaging. So we have three uh, Roche light cycler that we use for our COVID testing. Next slide. So my plan today is to walk you through the process we took to bring our COVID testing online and the considerations we had to manage as we work to do this. Through this talk, we're gonna discuss some safety concerns, reporting issues, and then validation considerations. Next slide. When we talk about safety, it's easy to limit the discussion to obvious safety issues. However, we need to consider more than just the obvious. I break safety into three considerations. There's actual safety, perceived safety, and logistical safety. Of course, this is not an exhaustive list and there are other things to take into account, but these are the subset I think get overlooked. When we're looking at setting up safety protocols, we have to be aware of the samples we are handling. Working with COVID-19 is relatively safe if the samples are handled following CDC and WHO guidelines. This includes performing steps that can create aerosols in a biosafety hood and using appropriate disinfectant protocols, as well as staff wearing the correct PPE. However, to do this, you have to think about what specific processes and infrastructure situations you need to be aware of. For example, where are potential sources of contamination for the lab staff and for potential contamination sources for the samples? What processes can create aerosols? And at what point is the virus inactivated? Next slide. The second safety concern that should be addressed is related to the perception of safety. Although it's relatively easy to maintain a safe environment within a lab using standard approaches, there's a heightened level of fear surrounding how the pandemic is presented in the media, especially in times like this when we're in the middle of a spike. When we started COVID testing, the laboratory staff was very concerned with their potential for infection. Once we had been testing for just a little bit, their fear level was reduced. However, in order to appropriately mitigate this fear, we offer full levels of PPE. The staff are required to wear gowns, masks, and gloves at all times when they're in the lab. But we also provide face shields, eye glasses, booties, and hair coverings. And as we know, some of these are probably not really going to do anything to protect the staff, but it makes them feel better. When the staff feels their safety needs are valued, they have less anxiety over testing. Less anxious staff relates to more accurate results. So by, by providing additional types of PPE, the staff is allowed to take a level of control over their risk, perceived or otherwise, which allows them to be more comfortable in the testing situation. The same can be said for process considerations. 
it is easy to over-engineer our safety processes and sample handling. There is a balance between staff comfort and true safety. Often the distance between the two shrinks as staff start to deal with the extra work comfort brings them. By maintaining communication about process with the staff, minor modifications can be made to processes that make them more comfortable without dropping efficiency or lab uh, protocols. It's important to remember that SOPs need to take into account process changes. One way to do this is to write in clearly labeled optional steps that don't change the process, but still take into account additional steps that may be taken, but are not necessary. This can be whether sample bags are opened under a hood or on the bench top. This can also include whether stations are disinfected more often than minimum required schedules. Next slide. A further issue we have to consider is how to keep the functioning of the lab logistically safe. For example, in Pennsylvania, the state government has been fairly proactive regarding uh, safety regulations. All businesses are supposed to require employees to wear masks, masks are required in public spaces, and travelers are expected to quarantine for two weeks or provide a negative COVID test within 72 hours of arriving in the state. Of course, these guidelines and enforcements differ by state, but labs should have their own internal guidelines for maintaining logistical safety while testing COVID-19. It only takes one employee not following appropriate precautions or being exposed to someone they thought was following appropriate precautions to start an outbreak in your lab. Absolute genomics requires all staff to be tested at a minimum of weekly. However, an employee can submit a swab anytime they are concerned about their potential exposure or health. In addition, we allow our employees to submit screening swabs for family and friends. Because our employees are not cloistered away from potential sources of infection, and because working in a testing lab can be seen as a higher risk job, we believe an offer of testing to friends and family gives a better insight for when an employee may have been exposed to infection, but also provides peace of mind to our employees who worry about putting their families at risk. Next slide. One of the benefits of the BGI reagents is the flexibility of running on the robot in high throughput and running manually for low throughput. We take advantage of the manual throughput option for TAF testing. This testing can perform before the lab gets Monday morning samples without wasting a lot of reagents, but also without having to worry about potentially infected staff working next to uninfected staff for most of the day while waiting until the late afternoon for results. Next slide. And so this is one reason that we were excited to use the MGISP 960. We can do high throughput, which is 192 samples in 80 minutes. We can also take that down to 96 samples in about 45 minutes. This machine is also compatible with third-party extraction kits, which means that after COVID slows down, we have an instrument that we can use for other panels that we test. And so this is suitable for post-pandemic clinical testing. Next slide. Of course, we all know that a COVID test result is a snapshot in time. A staff member could test negative on Monday morning and be infectious Tuesday morning. However, regular disinfectant use and mandatory mass usage helps to mitigate this risk. Next slide. Now that we've discussed policies for protecting staff from infection, the next question is what to do if a staff member does have a positive result. This question should be answered and a policy in place before samples come in the door, and at least there should be a plan in place prior to a positive result. This plan is something the staff should all be aware of. Although results are HIPAA protected, it's difficult in a small lab to completely protect the privacy of an individual. For an example, at an absolute, we have five testing personnel, as I've mentioned, and three accessioners. If someone were to come up positive, there's very little we can do to keep that confidential because the rest of the staff is actually the one sampling, reporting results, and accessioning uh, samples to begin with. The very act of quarantining a person after a positive test would inform the rest of the staff of a positive test. We mitigate this by reiterating the staff's responsibilities under HIPAA and by ensuring that each staff member is aware of the potential lack of confidentiality with the results of screening. 
Our policy for a positive test requires that the positive employee quarantines for 10 days after their positive test, following new CDC guidelines. We also require a negative test to come back to work. In addition, once an employee tests positive, we increase the frequency of mandatory testing in the lab from once per week to two to three times per week, depending on the potential for exposure. This increased frequency in staff lab testing is maintained for two weeks prior to the positive test result. The idea of employee screening and potential positives brings up the next item we had to consider as a COVID lab. And this is the process of reporting COVID results to state agencies. Next slide. Each state has different guidelines for reporting. Some have sophisticated systems for uploading results electronically. Others are a little bit less robust. It can often take a few days to weeks to get set up to report results correctly. It is important to have a plan for reporting results from any state you plan to accept samples. As you have to report positive and a negative to the originating state, not the state you test in. However, this can be confusing. Pennsylvania provides instructions that in the same page say to report all results to the state and only report results for Pennsylvania samples. Georgia requires all positive and negatives to be reported, but only requires positives while you're in the process of getting set up in their system. So being aware of what and how you have to report and having documentation of clarifying conversations that you can provide to inspectors is critical to maintaining compliance. In addition, it is easy to overlook the fact that staff samples are required for reporting. In Pennsylvania, the guidelines say all diagnostic and screening results must be reported. Since staff samples may not be accession, they can often be overlooked as samples. However, having a policy that clearly states what samples must be reported and how, based on conversations with regulatory bodies, will prevent exposure to financial and legal sanctions for failure to follow regulations. Next slide. You'll note that up to this point, my discussion has been centered around safety and regulatory policies that have little to do with the actual analysis of the samples. It's important to have a plan and a policy to account for these before you start testing. However, now that we've discussed this, we'll move on to getting a test put into place. Next slide. At the beginning of the pandemic, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services declared the pandemic a public health emergency. This was before we even deemed it to be a pandemic. This allowed the FDA to issue emergency use authorizations for products and procedures associated with the virus. Unfortunately, emergency use authorizations make testing more difficult to implement as it removes the ability of a laboratory to develop an LDT or a laboratory developed test and requires FDA oversight to move forward. This is not something that any of us were unaware of. Unfortunately, the FDA had a difficult time keeping up with EU applications and over the course of the spring and the summer issued a number of guidances that provided more freedom to labs. Unfortunately, these guidances could cause confusion with testing. In August, HHS issued an order preventing the FDA from requiring laboratories to have pre-market emergency use authorization clearance to offer a test. In October, the FDA stated they would quit reviewing LDTs for EUAs. Next slide. So then these decisions leave the lab with a number of options. First, they can use a pre-cleared EUA kit. Second, they can use an EUA clear kit and do a bridging study, bring on one or more components that were not part of the original EUA. For example, a different PCR instrument or extraction protocol. Finally, they can create their own lab-developed test. For high-complexity labs under CLIA, most tests are lab-developed tests. So this option isn't one that can cause a lot of concern for most experienced labs. However, it can be daunting for labs that have not operated in the high-complexity space before. In addition, some states won't allow labs licensed in that state to offer non-EUA tests. So when we talk about EUAs, the pros that we come up with is they're basically out of the box. They function almost as an FDA clear test. They're restricted, so that becomes a con because you can't move outside of what was approved and still be under the EUA. But 
The other issue is, although there's a low bar to starting to use them, the EUA is short term. And at some point, the emergency use authorization will go away and the test would have to be validated as a lab developed test. Next slide. So there's a lot of options. Do you use an EUA? Do you use a lab developed test? Do you use an EUA with a bridging? And what are the guidelines versus the states and federal government? An EUA is probably the easiest of the options if it exists. Of course, if you have to generate your own EUA, not an option for lab developed tests anymore anyhow, then it's the most complicated. A laboratory developed test is a performant characteristic most high complexity labs are used to operating under and has a fairly clear set of expectations. A bridge study is a fairly low bar to cross, but may not suffice for all tests. For example, at least up until last month, I've not checked this month, Georgia would not allow Georgia licensed labs to offer non-EUA approved tests. When bringing on a test then, you have to determine what approach is the best for you. Do you use a full EUA with no deviations, which means you have to have all the same instrumentation and all the same chemistry? Do you bridge one or two components to the EUA or do you do a full laboratory developed test? It's important to note that if you don't have a perfect EUA, your regulatory agency may consider your test to be a laboratory developed test. This means you should have all the required components of a laboratory developed test in your validation or supplemental to it to maintain compliance. It's also useful for when the public health declaration expires to have an LDT, because at that point, the EUA coverage would also expire. Next slide. So what we recommend is to do a bridge DUA LDT. It's kind of like a turducken, just not as tasty. In this way, you meet the minimum requirements for all three scenarios and protect yourself from overlapping regulations with inconsistent enforcement. If you're not familiar with a turducken, it's a dish that involves stucking a chicken into a turkey, into a duck, well, the other way around. It's definitely more work than just doing one or the other, but in the end, you don't have to choose and risk leaving something important off the table. And so when we look at the requirements for different types of tests, for an EUA, the requirements in the spring and the summer were 30 positive clinical samples, 30 negative clinical samples, a preliminary limited detection dilution series run in triplicate using a heat inactivated virus, not a synthetic virus. And then finally, a limited detection confirmation run of 20X on one sample with 95% amplification at that level. This would also require an examination of uh, interspecific uh, competition with the assay and other interfering substance tests. For bridging, all you'd have to do is a limited detection confirmation in a three-fold dilution series run in triplicate that's within three, is, is less than or equal to 3x limited detection for the original EUA. And then for a laboratory developed test, you have to do accuracy, which actually follows the same thing as the EUA number one and two, precision, which would be done in three and four or the bridging one. And you have to run, we also would run five positive samples in triplicate an additional day just to get additional precision. You want to do interfering substances. This could be the clinical samples, which have the biological matrix in them. We also would include things like nasal spray or Vaseline, um, or maybe even a little bit of, of blood for samples that are particularly difficult to collect. You would have to have an LOD, which is again, found in the EUA and the bridging study. And you need specificity and sensitivity and we use controls of other potential respiratory pathogens to determine these two metrics. Next slide. At Absolute, we chose to go with the BGI MGI approach. We did this because their EUA is fairly broad and when it comes to the instrument. It covers a variety of instruments, including the Roche LC480, the Light Cycle 480. A lot of other EUAs would only cover thermo instruments. And so this gave us a little bit of flexibility to go with another instrument we had in house. Next slide. The other thing that we really liked about this, um, this kit, this set of kits, is that it's part of a complete workflow that includes extraction reagents. This means that we're able to get all of our samples um, 
the, all of the reagents for these from the same source and don't have to supply for multiple different vendors. Next slide. Because this is also an integrated process using the MGI SB960, we're able to go from swab to reports and only have to worry about one reagent supplier in the, in the middle. Next slide. In addition, because this solution has dedicated resources, the risk of running out of consumables is significantly reduced. This is especially important now as we see the huge shortfall of pipette tips many labs are experiencing. Some labs have actually been told that they're looking at two to four month back orders on tips, which means that maybe I should have gone into plastic manufacturing instead of what I'm doing now. Next slide. The only drawback Absolute found with the BGI process is that the EUA was performed using 96 well plates, and we were planning on running 384 well plates. This is a relatively minor change. However, we still needed to do a bridging study to the original EUA. However, because of the different guidelines in some states that we mentioned, we wanted the assay we were offering to be as robustly supported as possible. So in addition to the minimum requirements of the bridging study, we also performed a validation as the same level is required to obtain an EUA. Next slide. When Blackhawk and, and Absolute first started working together, our project timeline was relatively short. From space move-in, from the time the instruments moved into the space, which was in August, until going live at the end of October, we had a very tight time frame to get samples, controls, reagents, staff hired, and have a validated test. Next slide. Because the, the BGI MGI uh, workflow is very uh, unilinear, we are able to uh, follow their advice for which types of instrumentation we needed to have in the lab. And so we were able to purchase a biosafety cabinet. We already had the real-time PCR machine, the centrifuge, water baths, and the automation system. Next slide. For the controls for our validation, uh, and we primarily sourced from Zeptometrics. We had the Zeptometrics heat inactivated COVID control, which is whole uh, virus. And we use the Zeptometrics RPP1 and RPP2 controls, which are mixtures of other respiratory pathogen uh, viruses and bacteria that we could potentially encounter in a, in a respiratory sample. Next slide. When we did our validation, looking at our concordance, we, in addition to the control samples, we also used uh, known clinical samples that were sourced from another uh, lab. And what we initially saw was a little disconcerting. We saw more non-concordant results than we wanted to, to see in a validation like this. However, when we started investigating these results, what we came to find out was, and the, the samples that we recorded as positive, that the, the source lab recorded as negative, we compared CT values and found that the CT value that the reference lab had was below their cutoff, so they called it a negative. And BGI was able to pull that out at a higher sensitivity and determine positive sample. The other thing we noticed was there were a number of samples that had been compromised when they were running and the, the fluid had, had dried up a little bit too much. We ran them anyways just to see if they would work and they didn't. And so this was not actually an issue of the assay, but of, of compromised samples. And so when we adjusted for these, these effects, we ended up having 100% concordance with, um, with non-borderline samples. And for borderline samples, we had a higher sensitivity, a higher uh, limit of detection or lower limit of detection. Next slide. So in summary, I want to talk just a little bit and uh, go over what we've talked about. First, when you're working on setting up a COVID clinical lab, the first thing you have to do is start with safety planning. Safety planning and procedure is the primary, most important thing you can do. If you have 
staff that are getting sick, your lab will be shut down, and there's there's going to be uh, effects to both patients and your the company as a whole. And so we need to make sure that we're protecting our staff and also protecting our logistical uh, workflows. We need to be adaptable to changing federal and state regulations. There have been multiple changes from February all the way up till now as to what is required or not required, what's expected and not expected, and there will be more changes. If we plan for the changes, then we have less problems later on. We need to make sure that we have planned ahead for how we're gonna report. You don't wanna receive a sample from a state that you're not able to report and then take a week to be able to report it and they're out of compliance with the 24 hour reporting. We need to mitigate the risk in lab supply by choosing a supplier who can dedicate supplies to you. And this is something that we have found to be the case um, working with MGI and BGI. And by investing in automation early, we're able to maximize the return on investment in the post-pandemic era. We will be able to use the instruments that we've put into place for COVID testing, for testing after the COVID pandemic has um, uh, slowed down and we're working on other projects. And then we have to consider what the best type of validation we can do. Is it an EUA? Is it an LDT? Is it a bridging? Or is it the Turducken? I want to thank you very much for listening, and we'd be glad to answer any questions you may have.